Welcome, listener. I'm glad you're here. Take a seat. Next to the fire. Welcome to Obscura, where we shine a light on the dark. Listener, our homes are the one place where we're meant to feel safe. At the end of a bad day at work or school, most of us take a great deal of comfort in knowing we can retreat to the familiar, or we know we have a soft place to fall with people whom we may disagree and bicker with at times, but can ultimately take comfort from those we love who share that sacred space with us. We get attached to our homes and the memories that we create there. Even the very structure of a house itself sometimes seems to take on a personality of its own. The way that a certain floorboard creaks if you step on a particular spot, or the way you have to jiggle the gate to get it to close properly. These are examples of the quirks of a house that, far from being imperfections, we come to know as reassurance that we are in a place that may not be perfect to some, but is perfect for us. As many of us have experienced... Moving can be a stressful experience at the best of times, let alone being faced with a situation where relocating isn't even up for discussion. When this happens due to a job promotion or other non-negotiable family circumstances, it can be upsetting, but we understand and hope we'll soon settle into our new home, where we can get acquainted with our new neighborhood and create new memories to build on the existing ones. The Listener What happens when your home is destroyed in a natural disaster or accident and you lose the very people you need around you? You have no home to go to and are cast adrift without the people you love, who you rely on to make difficult times easier to bear. You feel abandoned and alone. And listener, what happens if that accident that destroyed your home and killed your loved ones wasn't actually determined to be an accident at all? but something far more sinister, caused by the last person on Earth you'd suspect. This is what we contemplate in today's story. Now, let's get on with it. Part 1. Girl Genius Deborah Jones was born on February 28, 1951, to her parents, Bob and Joanne, in Havana, in the state of Illinois. Deborah was born 19 months after older sister Pamela. From a young age, it was clear to both Deborah's teachers and her family that her level of academic aptitude far exceeded that of her classmates. Her talents extended to the piano and violin. She loved to read novels and was a natural when it came to athletic pursuits like tennis and soccer. Following the family relocating due to Bob's work, Deborah started attending Metamora Township High School in Illinois. In Deborah's junior year of high school, the family relocated again, this time to a farming community near Peora, where Deborah attended Peora Central High School. Far from being a typical awkward teen who had trouble making friends as a new student, Deborah had no trouble fitting in at her new high school environment. She developed a reputation as someone with quick wit, becoming a cheerleader, serving on the student council, and joining the choir and the French club. Deborah's IQ of 165 and her perfect GPA made it clear to her peers and teachers that she was someone who was going places. So it came as no surprise that when Deborah graduated high school, she was named as both a National Merit Scholar and co-valedictorian of her class. In 1969, 18-year-old Deborah started attending the University of Illinois, where she majored in chemistry. She eventually broke up with her high school sweetheart, but it wasn't long until she met and started dating an engineering student named Dwayne Green. In terms of her future career aspirations, Deborah's first passion was chemical engineering, but when she graduated college in 1972, She found herself reconsidering her chosen career path. 
The competition for jobs within the chemical engineering sector at the time was tough, so Deborah reevaluated her options. Deborah and Duane married in 1974, and Deborah decided to enroll in medical school. She graduated from the University of Kansas School of Medicine in 1975 at age 24. Always the go getter, Deborah chose the high pressure, fast paced specialty of emergency medicine. By the time she was undertaking her residency, Deborah and Duane had moved to the city of Independence in the nearby state of Missouri. Newlywed bliss wouldn't last long, though, and by 1978, the couple had divorced. In the book, Bitter Harvest by late author Ann Rule, it was reported that Deborah and Duane's split was believed to be amicable, but a year before the divorce was finalized, Deborah had already met somebody else. 23-year-old Michael Farrar was a talented medical student with a bright future. Even though he was four years Deborah's junior, Michael was attracted to her drive and intelligence, and Deborah felt secure in her new relationship with someone she felt was a reliable partner. The pair married in May 1979, but Michael later stated that the relationship wasn't one of typical newlyweds, and that neither he nor Deborah ever expressed their love for each other verbally. Much to Michael's disappointment, Deborah showed no interest in getting to know Michael's family, nor spending quality time with her new in-laws. Michael also harbored concerns about his bride's temper, which at times could be volatile and unpredictable, but her ambition and passion to succeed was energizing. Following Michael's graduation from medical school at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, he and Deborah moved to Ohio, where Michael commenced a three-year residency in internal medicine at the University of Cincinnati. Deborah continued to work as an emergency physician, but she soon tired of the specialty and decided to join Michael in his internal medicine residency. Part 2. Not-So-Happy Families It was following the couple's move to Ohio that Deborah's health started to suffer. She required surgery on an infected wrist and also experienced crippling migraines as well as insomnia. Despite these medical issues, Deborah and Michael welcomed their first child, Tim, into the world on January 20th, 1982. 31-year-old Deborah wasted no time getting back to work following the birth and employed a nanny to help look after Tim after taking six weeks maternity leave. By this stage of her career, Deborah was undertaking a fellowship in hematology and oncology, but again took maternity leave two years later for the birth of the couple's second child, Kate, in 1984. Deborah completed her fellowship and opened her own practice in 1985. Michael, too, was in the final stages of his fellowship in cardiology, which he completed in 1986. It was that same year that the Farrar family moved back to Missouri putting down roots in Kansas City. The Salina Journal newspaper reported that from 1986 to 1994, the couple worked at Trinity Lutheran Hospital, with Michael also working at North Kansas City Hospital. Feeling established, Deborah opened a private practice during this period, but much to her disappointment, the hospital her practice was attached to suddenly closed, and she found herself pregnant for a third time. The pregnancy was an unexpected surprise, but Michael was thrilled about the impending arrival of another child. However, for Deborah, this was not part of the plan, and she resented her dreams of pursuing a private practice being put on hold long term. On December 13, 1988, the couple's second daughter and third child, Kelly, was born. But 37 year old Deborah struggled in the postpartum period and found her levels of self-esteem plummeting as she struggled to lose the baby weight following her pregnancy with Kelly. Despite this challenge, and no longer working in a private practice, Deborah came to find a new identity in motherhood, and went that extra mile to ensure that every birthday and the holidays were memorable for her children. Michael later remembered his wife as nothing less than a dedicated mother to their young family. Deborah and Michael's professional and financial success meant they were able to afford not only the best education for their children, but also nannies to help the household run smoothly. The kids attended a private school in Kansas City, where all manner of extracurricular activities and opportunities were available. 
Tim was passionate about sports, especially soccer and ice hockey. He also loved to cook and had a strong social conscience. Sticking up for other kids at school were targeted by bullies. Kate was a talented ballet dancer, and by the time she was 10 years old, was performing with the State Ballet of Missouri. Kelly had inherited her mother's love of reading, and all three children took swimming and tennis lessons. Deborah had been an animal lover all her life. Much to her children's delight, the family adopted a black Labrador named Boomer, who slept in the children's bedrooms. There were mixed reports from other parents at the children's school about Deborah's involvement in her kids' lives. Some said she was nothing less than encouraging, but to others, she appeared overbearing and critical of her children's performance. A nanny who worked for the family later recalled that on one occasion, Deborah told her, I didn't want kids. I never had. I'm just doing it for Mike. But despite being in a position to afford private schooling and activities for her children, Deborah's work suffered when her health issues returned. Up until 1989, she continued to work at Trinity Lutheran Hospital, until she eventually made the difficult decision to stop full-time work. Instead, she would work part-time from the family home, which would also allow her to be more involved in her children's education and after-school activities. Deborah and Mike hired a new nanny who would stay with the family for the next four years, but it was a big change for Deborah academically. She was no longer in the thick of work she found challenging and engaging. Instead, working on medical peer reviews and processing Medicaid claims. For Deborah, the work was dull and uninspiring, and it didn't go unnoticed amongst her former colleagues, who had always described Deborah as having a terrible bedside manner when it came to her interactions with patients, which were unempathetic to say the least. It was also around this time that Deborah's behavior towards Michael appeared to shift. Gone was the supportive wife who had once found her husband dependable. In her place was a woman who had instead become suspicious and obsessive about her husband, who started working longer hours in an attempt to escape the tension at home. In an effort to dull the chronic physical pain she was experiencing, 38-year-old Deborah started self-medicating with an array of sedatives and narcotics, some of which were prescribed illegally. This continued for the next several years and affected her moods, coping skills, and ability to contribute equally to household tasks such as cooking and cleaning, to such a degree that Michael confronted his wife on several occasions. Deborah would eventually agree that it wasn't a healthy way to manage her pain long term, and assured her husband that she would stop being over reliant on prescription medication. But Deborah's temper was still proving unpredictable. The book Bitter Harvest details how, irrespective of whether she was in the family home, a professional setting with patients and colleagues, or a crowded shopping mall. Deborah's angry outbursts started to see her destroy things and even harm herself. By the early 90s, Deborah was also involving the children in her arguments with Michael, venting her frustrations with their father in the process, manipulating the kids in such a way that they turned against him. Their eldest child, Tim, was so angry with his father that their relationship became fraught with the usual parent-teacher disagreements escalating to physical confrontations. The Manhattan Mercury newspaper later reported that on one occasion, Michael knocked him to the ground during an argument, and on another, pushed him into a wall. By early 1994, 38-year-old Michael had had enough. In January, he told Deborah he wanted a divorce, and to say that she didn't take it well is an understatement. Deborah lashed out at Michael, becoming physically violent, causing him to move out of the family home and into an apartment. The children would stay with Deborah, and even though things were bad between her and Michael, they agreed at the time to share custody of the kids. With Michael out of the house, this provided a respite from the constant strain between her husband and wife, and the temporary abatement of tension provided some hope that cooler heads would prevail. Michael and Deborah maintained contact in an effort to rectify things, both agreed to a fresh start as a family unit by moving into a bigger house. In May 1994, the couple set their sights on purchasing a six-bedroom home located in the affluent suburb of Prairie Village, across the state line in Kansas. However, Michael started to have second thoughts, and the sale fell through when he realized that such a financial commitment would mean in the face of trying to save a marriage which was hanging by a thread. The prospect of the couple getting into even more debt 
wasn't something that sat comfortably with Michael and went against his better judgment. It wasn't long after Deborah and Michael's plans to move were canceled that the family suffered another blow. On May 21, 1994, while the family was out, their existing home caught fire. The cause was identified as accidental, thanks to an electrical fault from a power cord. The house sustained significant damage, but thankfully, the financial impact of repairing the home and replacing the family's damaged belongings was absorbed by the insurance payout. This prompted Deborah and Michael to reconsider the aborted purchase of the home in Prairie Village, and in the interim, Deborah and the children moved into Michael's apartment that he had been renting during the separation. With the purchase of the $400,000 Prairie home finalized in June 1994, the family moved in. In addition to 18 rooms, a pool, four-car garage, and a jacuzzi, the three-level, 5,000-square-foot Tudor-style home also boasted an intercom system. The master bedroom was situated on ground level, while the children's bedroom and bathroom occupied the second story. Prairie Village was home to high flyers and people who had succeeded in their fields, and the palatial size of the homes in the area reflected this. Deborah felt like she was finally home, amongst people as successful as she was. This was somewhere that she and Michael could finally get their marriage back on track. For a brief period, 43-year-old Deborah seemed to do a complete 180 when it came to homemaking responsibilities. Putting increased effort into cooking meals and being house proud, Michael also took the opportunity as a wake-up call when it came to maintaining a better work-life balance. He cut back on his hours at work to allow him to focus on his marriage and family. But despite the lifestyle changes, the couple made an attempt to patch up their failing marriage. Their newfound happiness was short-lived. By the end of 1994, the couple were back to square one and arguing just as much, if not more. The one remaining chance of salvaging the marriage was their family vacation to Peru, scheduled for June 1995 in conjunction with a school trip for Tim. For Michael, this would be the make-or-break litmus test for the relationship. It was while on vacation in Peru that Michael met another parent whose child attended the same school as the Farrar children who had come on the school trip to chaperone. Like Michael and Deborah, Margaret Hacker and her husband also worked in the medical sector, and the couple had two children. Margaret worked as a registered nurse, while her husband was an anesthesiologist. The more Michael got to know Margaret over the course of the trip, it was revealed that she too was in an unhappy marriage and the attraction between Michael and Margaret was undeniable. Upon returning from Peru, Michael and Margaret continued to spend time together, and it wasn't long before the pair were having an affair. Michael knew there was no future for him and Deborah, and in late July 1995, he asked her for a divorce. Not one to take such an announcement lying down, Deborah was distraught and told the children their father was abandoning them. During this time, Deborah continued to drink heavily, and following Michael's decision, Deborah's level of alcohol consumption increased dramatically, and she often drank until she passed out. Given that Deborah continued to drive their kids to and from school and their extracurricular activities, Michael was so concerned about his wife's level of alcohol intake that he decided to continue to live in the family home to ensure his children were safe and appropriately supervised. Deborah's failure to maintain housework and meal preparation tasks meant that 13-year-old Tim was doing the majority of the cooking. Deborah's ongoing heavy drinking saw her continue to spiral out of control. On August 4th, she called Michael at work telling him she was walking along the busy city roads in the hope that she'd be hit and killed by a car. When Michael raced around to the house, he searched every corner. Deborah eventually called Michael and told him she'd been hiding in the basement the whole time and that she wanted to make him worry about her. On August 11th, 1995, Michael suddenly fell ill with gastrointestinal symptoms, including nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Given the family had just returned from Peru, Michael wrote off his symptoms as that of a lingering stomach bug 
that most of the group on the school trip had contracted. Just when it seemed Michael was about to make a full recovery, a week after the onset of his symptoms, his condition deteriorated. On August 18th, Michael was admitted to a hospital, suffering from severe dehydration, weight loss, and fever, and doctors considered his condition life-threatening. During his admission, Michael developed sepsis, which arose from bacteria leaking through his perforated gastrointestinal tract. Despite confirming the origin of the infection, doctors failed to identify the actual cause, which was unable to be attributed to a parasite or any specific tropical disease. A week later, Michael was discharged from the hospital, having made a significant recovery. But that same night, the symptoms returned, and he was readmitted. The only thing Michael had consumed was the evening meal, which was served by Deborah, but could have been fixed by Tim, who was also doing most of the household cooking. Michael couldn't work out why he couldn't seem to shake the illness. Perhaps it was aggravated by trying to return to his usual diet too soon. Michael was discharged from his second hospital admission on August 30th, but on September 4th, he again fell ill for a third time and returned to the hospital where he would stay for another week. Doctors were now convinced that the cause of Michael's reoccurring symptoms was contracted in Peru. The problem was that none of Michael's debilitating symptoms seemed to fit precisely with any one diagnosis. In the absence of any drastic dietary changes, Michael looked to psychosomatic factors in an effort to identify the cause of his illness. Given that his symptoms returned almost immediately upon being discharged and into Deborah's care on each occasion, he assumed it must have been due to stress and anxiety he was experiencing as his marriage crumbled. But then another theory was given to Michael which blindsided him. His new partner Margaret, whom he had met on the Peru school trip, suggested that Deborah was poisoning her husband. The whole idea was too preposterous to be true, but as outrageous as the proposition was, the seeds of doubt had been planted into Michael's mind. The common precursor to all of Michael's hospitalizations was that he ate food that he'd been served by Deborah. Michael continued to turn over in his mind the possibility that Deborah wanted to seriously harm or even kill him. By late September 1995, Michael decided to search the house to see if there was any truth to Margaret's suggestion that Deborah was trying to poison her husband. When Michael went through Deborah's purse, he found a copy of a letter that he'd previously received from an anonymous author, asking him to reconsider the divorce. He also found empty vials of potassium chloride, multiple packets of seeds which the packaging indicated as castor beans, empty syringes, and a receipt from an early May garden center in Olathe, dated August 7th that same year. Michael decided to take the unusual items from Deborah's purse and hide them for safekeeping. On September 25th, he approached Deborah about her plans for the castor beans. Michael knew that Deborah didn't have a green thumb, so when she told him she was intending to plant the seeds, he didn't believe her. Deborah eventually admitted that she was planning to use the seeds to take her own life. Immediately following the conversation with Michael about the castor beans, Deborah started drinking heavily and continued throughout the day. Michael became so concerned about her behavior and his kids' welfare that he called the police. When law enforcement arrived at the home, officers found Deborah drunk in bed. Michael told the officers he feared his wife was suicidal. But upon hearing this, Deborah began verbally abusing and cursing at Michael. When she showed police the items he'd found in Deborah's purse, they decided it was best to take her to the nearest hospital for assessment. When Deborah was examined, it was noted that she smelled of alcohol and appeared disheveled. After speaking with Deborah, the emergency room doctor documented that despite her appearance, she was coping the best she could, giving her marriage was falling apart in acrimonious fashion. Deborah told the doctor she had no intention to self-harm or hurt anyone else. And the assessment was progressing well until Michael arrived at the hospital. When Deborah spotted him, she lashed out, spat at him, and called him a fuckhole. Screaming, you're gonna get these kids over our dead bodies. After staff managed to subdue Deborah, she agreed that being voluntarily committed would be beneficial in terms of monitoring her mental health 
but soon after, Deborah couldn't be found anywhere on the hospital grounds. When she was finally located, she decided to walk home from the hospital. She was still in agreement about voluntary admission and was taken to a hospital in Topeka. It was here that Deborah was diagnosed with major bipolar depression with suicidal impulses and prescribed various medications. After only a short stay of four days, Deborah was discharged. Meanwhile, Michael had used the brief respite at home as an opportunity to research information about castor beans. What he found out not only chilled him to the bone, but turned his stomach. Castor beans, which grow on the castor plant, are the source of a naturally occurring but deadly chemical called ricin. Thanks to popular culture, ricin is most commonly known as a biowarfare agent. When the pulp of the castor bean is ingested, even in minuscule quantities, ricin attacks the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract, including the esophagus, stomach, and small and large intestine, causing ulceration. Symptoms include rapid dehydration, severe abdominal pain, low blood pressure, and an increased heart rate. It was no wonder Michael's symptoms returned with a vengeance every time he'd return home from the hospital into Deborah's care. As much as he could never have imagined it, Michael knew that Deborah was using the beans to poison his food. Despite making the heart-wrenching decision to leave his children, Michael now held grave fears for his safety. Things didn't improve for Deborah following her return home, and she continued to act in a bizarre manner and drank heavily prompting Michael to move out of the family home for good on October 5th and what was surely an attempt to console the kids, or perhaps herself, in the wake of Michael's departure. Deborah adopted a greyhound named Russell, but the acquisition of a new pet didn't seem to placate the fragile situation in the family home. Deborah was still angry with Michael, and in fits of rage and drunkenness, belligerently lectured the children about how their father had abandoned them all to be with Margaret claiming he cared more about his new girlfriend than his own kids. Part 3. Tinderbox October 23, 1995, was the first day of a brief home-based vacation for Michael Farrar. Only a month earlier, he'd been discharged from his third hospital admission for acute gastrointestinal symptoms, and he was easing back into work due to the physically debilitating nature of his illness. Michael spent the afternoon with Margaret, then later picked up Tim and Kelly to go to a hockey game Tim was playing. Following the game, Michael dropped Tim and Kelly off at home at approximately 8.45 p.m. Michael then had dinner with his girlfriend, Margaret, during which time he received two calls on his pager. Just before he drove back to his apartment at around 11.30 p.m., he received a third call. The calls were from Deborah, whom he spoke to when he arrived home, but soon got into an argument. Michael had had enough of Deborah's heavy drinking and irresponsible behavior, especially considering she was the children's primary caregiver. Michael accused Deborah of poisoning him, and he threatened to contact social services to intervene. When the phone call ended abruptly, Michael continued to watch television to try and unwind from the heated confrontation. At 20 minutes after midnight, on October 24, 1995, a 911 call was made from the family home. The nature of the emergency wasn't clear, as the caller hung up the phone without speaking. Police were dispatched to the address, and when they arrived, they found the home ablaze. When firefighters arrived minutes later, they found Deborah and 10-year-old Kate outside the house. But 13-year-old Tim and 6-year-old Kelly were still inside. A distraught Kate had no idea why her siblings hadn't managed to escape and was inconsolable. She begged firefighters to save her siblings, who were still trapped inside the house and unaccounted for. In contrast, firefighters and officers on the scene noted that Deborah appeared to be very calm and cool. Of course, it was entirely possible that Deborah was in shock, having narrowly escaped with her life and was watching on helplessly, not knowing the fate of her other children. At 12.30 a.m., the phone rang at Michael's apartment, where he was still watching TV. 
A neighbor who lived next door to Deborah and the kids was on the line and frantically relayed that there was a fire at the house. A panicked and confused Michael jumped in the car and immediately drove over. By the time he arrived, firefighters had made their way inside the home, but were prevented from conducting a thorough search due to the ferocity of the flames that were rapidly consuming the dwelling. With the home at risk of collapse due to the intense heat and high winds that were hampering their efforts due to the fire spreading, firefighters were forced to abandon their effort to search for Tim and Kelly. When Michael arrived at the scene, he initially thought that all the children had escaped. It wasn't until some time later that a new and horrifying reality would dawn on the unsuspecting father. As fire crews fought to bring the roaring flames under control, the level of destruction to what had once been the family's dream home was clear. The house was gutted, with irreparable structural damage to the wooden frame, not just from the flames, but smoke and water. The only thing left standing was the garage. The stonework around the front entryway of the house had created a gaping facade, like a grotesque yawn framing the smoldering remnants behind. Part 4. Cause and Effect While investigators stayed at the house to carefully pick through the debris and determine the cause of the fire, police arranged for a stunned Deborah and a shocked and distressed Michael and Kate to be questioned separately. According to the Salina Journal, even though Deborah and Kate were in the backseat of the same police car, they didn't console each other or even speak. It wasn't until later that morning, after the dawn had broken when the home was considered structurally safe to search that the bodies of Tim and Kelly were recovered. Kelly was found lying in her bed, curled up and appeared to be asleep. She had died of smoke inhalation, even though the door to her bedroom was closed. The body of Boomer, one of the family dogs, was also found underneath Kelly's bed. It initially appeared that Tim had made it out of the bedroom. While it was thought that Tim had almost managed to escape... The Kansas City Star newspaper reported that Tim's body actually had fallen through the ground floor after the second-story flooring in his bedroom collapsed. He had died from heat exposure and smoke inhalation near his bedroom, and the significant amount of burns to his body had all been sustained post-mortem. Russell the Greyhound had also passed away in the Inferno. It was during Michael's police interview that he received just about the worst news possible, that his oldest and youngest children had perished in the fire, as did the family dogs. As he grappled to come to terms with the news, the devastated father was open with the police about the difficulties in his marriage and home life, including Deborah's drinking and several threats she'd made in the past to take her own life. Michael had also stated that his ex-wife had said she wished his girlfriend Margaret was dead, that these stresses had been exacerbated by Michael's gastrointestinal illness. Michael told the police that the marriage breakup was tough on Deborah because she was very concerned about money. Michael also stated that he felt Deborah may have intentionally set fire to the house so she could make an insurance claim. However, he had no reason to fear that she would ever harm their children. Immediately following his police interview, Michael initiated divorce proceedings and applied for full custody of his surviving daughter, Kate. However, Kate was explicit that she didn't want to live with her father, so Michael's parents were awarded temporary custody. The court considered Deborah to be incapable of caring for her daughter, but also took Kate's feelings into account about her relationship with her father. After all, thanks to Deborah, Kate continued to blame Michael for making her mother so upset in the first place. Deborah was also cooperative with investigators telling police that the day before the fire, she picked the kids up from school in the afternoon and took Kate shoe shopping. Everyone came home to do their chores as usual. Then Deborah took Kate to a ballet class before heading off to her own psychiatrist appointment. Kate was excited about her role in the State Ballet of Missouri's upcoming production of The Nutcracker, in which her younger sister, Kelly, was playing an angel. Michael then arrived at the family home to take Tim and Kelly to Tim's hockey game. As previously arranged, Deborah corroborated Michael's statement that he dropped Tim and Kelly off at home later that evening. 
Deborah stated that following dinner with the kids, she had a couple of alcoholic drinks before retiring to her bedroom. Kay and Kelly went to bed, each taking one of the family's two dogs with them. Deborah told police that when Michael moved out earlier that month, she moved back into the master bedroom, which is where she was sleeping on the night of the fire. According to Deborah, it was in this room that she said she fell asleep between 9.30 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. with the door closed. She stated that around 11 p.m. she woke to find Tim in the kitchen fixing a snack, but that they both went to bed soon after. In a conflicting account later in the interview, Deborah told police that she spoke to Michael around 10 or 10.30 p.m., who she claimed called the house, wanting to know who had paged him, before she eventually fell asleep at 11.30 p.m., Deborah explained that her marriage to Michael had broken down and that they were planning on getting a divorce. She stated that she wasn't upset about it, but acknowledged that Tim and Kate especially were finding it extremely difficult dealing with the upheaval. Deborah later changed the time that she last spoke to Michael to between 11 and 11.30 p.m. Deborah then said she woke up just after midnight to the sound of an alarm coming from within the home. In her groggy state, she thought that one of the family dogs must have tripped the burglar alarm, so she fumbled around in the bedroom in an attempt to disable it at the control panel, but the shrill sound of the alarm continued to pierce the air. When Deborah opened her bedroom door and saw smoke, she realized that it was the fire alarm that was sounding. Deborah stated that she closed the bedroom door and made her way out of the house through a sliding glass door onto an external deck that was connected to her bedroom. It was after she made it to the deck that Deborah heard her son Tim on the home's intercom system, frantically asking his mother what he should do. Deborah knew that Tim had crawled out of his bedroom window on numerous occasions in the past, but she told police that she advised Tim to stay in the house until firefighters arrived. She also told Tim that if he felt he needed to do something, he should go look for his younger sister. Deborah then ran to her neighbor's house, asking them to call 911. By the time Deborah had returned to the house, Kate had climbed out of her bedroom window and was standing on the roof of the garage. Deborah said she yelled out for her daughter to jump, but admitted to not catching her, with Kate landing on the ground. Deborah had not sustained any injuries from the fire. She told police that at no stage was she ever in danger of being exposed to the flames, including when she was on the deck outside her bedroom. Up until this point in the interview, Investigators had noted that Deborah hadn't cried and had indeed appeared talkative. She'd been vague about certain aspects of her account, including times of particular occurrences, but she was adamant that the kids all hated their father for being unfaithful to Deborah and then moving out, even suggesting that Margaret had set the fire to eliminate the family entirely so she could have Michael all to herself. She didn't refer to her children by their names but their ages spoke about Tim and Kelly in the past tense. Police noted that at least an hour had passed since the interview had commenced before Deborah asked about Tim and Kelly's welfare. When it was confirmed that the bodies of Tim and Kelly had been located in the charred ruins of the home, Deborah initially appeared to be overcome with sadness, but in contrast to her ex-husband, she became angry upon hearing the news. She started yelling at the police and accusing the firefighters of not trying hard enough to rescue Tim and Kelly, saying, Christ, I saved one kid. I could have saved another one. I'll never forgive myself for that. Did they even try? Deborah became confrontational, demanding that she be taken back to the family home to see the damage for herself. Deborah was free to leave after a police interview, but obviously she now had no home to go to. After borrowing some money from Michael, she went to a local motel, given there was no way her ex-husband was agreeing to have her stay with him. When Deborah's divorce attorney made contact with her later that day, Deborah was said to be extremely distressed, had an unkempt appearance, and was repeatedly asking about whether her children had died. Police made inquiries with Deborah's neighbors to ascertain whether they'd noticed anything unusual in the weeks, days, and hours leading up to the fire, as well as the night itself. Neighbors did report that when Deborah knocked on their door during the fire to ask to call 911, they noticed her hair was wet, and told police they immediately suspected that Deborah was responsible for the fire based on her detached demeanor. Two days after the fire that claimed the lives of her siblings, 
Kate's paternal grandparents sat in on our interview to provide support for their granddaughter. Kate told police that on the night of the fire, she awoke to see smoke coming into her room underneath her bedroom door. She ran to the door and yanked it open, calling out to Tim, who she could hear calling out to her from his room. To keep herself safe, Kate shut the door and called 911 from her room. But as she couldn't hear anyone on the line over the piercing noise of the fire alarm, she hung up. This was the call received by emergency dispatch at 12.20 a.m., where no one was on the line. Escaping through the door and downstairs wasn't an option, so a terrified Kate took the only other route she could. She climbed out of her bedroom window into the chilly night air and onto the roof of the garage. With no idea where the rest of her family was or whether they were alive, Kate squinted through the smoke billowing outside the house. Her eyes stinging and breath catching from the fumes and burning ash that were engulfing the air around her. Kate called out to her mother in the hopes she'd get a response. She felt a flood of relief when she heard her mother calling back over the noise of the wind and the crackling of the burning house. When Kate searched the darkness for the source of her mother's voice, she realized Deborah had escaped and was standing on the ground. Deborah called out to Kate to jump off the roof and into her arms. With no other choice, Kate leapt off the roof. But instead of Deborah catching her daughter, she missed and Kate landed on the ground but fortunately wasn't injured by the impact. Kate told police that Deborah was terribly upset during the fire and that she loved her mother, who she felt was a good role model. Kate told police that when Michael arrived at the scene, he started yelling accusations at Deborah, who was crying and desperate to find out what had happened to Tim and Kelly. Kate was confused and anguished that Tim hadn't managed to escape out of the bedroom window. Police asked Kate for some background on her parents' relationship, and how things had been at home prior to the fire. Kay was emphatic that she and her siblings loved their mother and that Deborah maintained close bonds with all the children. Kate also told police that she was angry with Michael for moving out, as it upset Deborah so much she'd started drinking heavily. A painstaking examination of the scene of the fire revealed that most of the extensive damage centered around the upper section of the northern end of the house, which was where the children's bedrooms were situated. There was significantly less damage to the master bedroom. Investigators found signs of an accelerant being poured on the floors of both stories of the home, with a large amount having been poured on the floor of the living room. The flammable liquid had been poured up the hallway of the second story and across the stairs leading from the first to the second story, effectively cutting off the stairway as a potential escape route. The poor pattern of the accelerant led from the door of the master bedroom which was not closed at the time of the fire, but open. The remains of the melted plastic were found on the floor throughout the house, which was evidence of accelerant having been carried to different rooms. An empty container of charcoal lighter fluid was found on the floor of the garage. On October 27th, Tim and Kelly were laid to rest at Highland Park Cemetery in Kansas City. Their interment followed an emotional double funeral service attended by 300 people mourning the loss of two children who had bright futures and infinite possibilities ahead of them. But one person whose behavior didn't reflect the anguish shared by everyone else present was their mother. Listener, we all understand that grief takes many forms and manifests itself in different ways. But mourners at the funeral were appalled by Deborah's behavior. Detailed in the book Bitter Harvest, Deborah swore at both Michael's father and the funeral director, while openly criticizing the funeral arrangements, saying, I don't need any more of this shit. Shut the fuck up. When a song chosen by Michael was played during the funeral, Deborah was seen sticking her finger in her mouth and pretending to gag. The circumstances surrounding the fire gave law enforcement cause to classify the investigation as a case of arson, and the Eastern Kansas Multi-Agency Task Force was called in to investigate. While there was no doubt that the windy conditions of the night of the fire intensified the blaze, the speed with which the fire took hold through the house simply couldn't be solely attributed to an accident. Accidental fires only have one point of origin and generally start in basements. 
The two furnaces in the family home were located in the basement, where the investigators also found evidence of multiple unconnected smaller fires, as well as two electrical panels and water heaters. But this wasn't where the fire originated. In a report issued by the task force early in November, investigators noted that the fire had multiple points of origin, including a suspicious area of self-contained fire in a vanity drawer of the master bedroom. Investigators deduced that the accelerant was between 3 to 10 gallons of isoparaffin, which is the chemical used in charcoal lighter fluid, the same fluid sold in bottles like the empty one found on the floor of the Ferrar's garage. The evidence at the scene left no doubt that arson was responsible, with Tim and Kelly's death therefore considered homicide. In the days following their deaths, a second task force was called in to commence a formal murder investigation. Under Kansas law at the time, even without evidence of premeditation, whoever was responsible for the fire could be charged with a first-degree murder of Tim and Kelly, given their deaths occurred as a result of arson. Included in the potential pool of suspects were people who lived in the home or had an intimate knowledge of its layout. Given that liquid accelerant was used, investigators knew that the person who lit the fire would likely have sustained singeing or burning when the blaze ignited. Following forensic testing of hair samples and clothing that Michael and Deborah had each been wearing on the night of the fire, there was nothing to indicate that Michael had been present when the fire started. There is no evidence of Deborah's clothing having come into contact with accelerant, but her hair was a different story. The report by neighbors that Deborah's hair was wet was consistent with what can happen when someone uses accelerant to start a fire. When ignited, the vapors from accelerant can create a flash which cause burns and singeing, which will often prompt an arsonist to immediately douse their head in water. Despite Deborah having cut her hair twice since her police interview, there were significant signs that her hair was singed. As investigators dug deeper into the background of Deborah and Michael's troubled marriage, they revisited Michael's previous concerns that Deborah had attempted to poison him on multiple occasions. Police decided to trace the packets of castor beans that Michael had found in Deborah's purse in September. Officers traced the origin of the packets in their homemade garden center in Olathe through handwritten contact details contained in Deborah's address book. It was also revealed that a second purchase of castor beans had been made on September 20th from a different homemade garden center in North Kansas City. When investigators contacted the store to see if anyone matching Deborah's description had made such a purchase, the store advised that in the month prior, a female customer ordered 10 packets of castor beans, which were at the time out of season, saying she needed them for a school science fair. But investigators found that there had been no such science fair at the kids' school. To help authorities get to the bottom of any alleged poisoning, Michael provided blood samples to police. Local testing failed to identify any sign of residual ricin in Michael's system, but the samples were sent to Washington, D.C. for more sophisticated testing. Meanwhile, Michael's medical issues continued. His previous repeated bouts of severe gastrointestinal distress had resulted in bacterial endocarditis, a heart valve infection that results from ingesting castor beans. A month following the fire, Michael underwent surgery, when the result of the blood test came back, the levels of rice and antibodies were so high that it was clear that Michael had ingested the toxin on numerous occasions. That same month, news reports started to indicate that Michael had allegedly been poisoned and that this was linked to the fire. But authorities remained tight-lipped about who they believed were responsible for either offense. The public didn't have to wait long for more details, though. And on November 22nd, Deborah was arrested. She faced two counts of first-degree murder for the deaths of Tim and Kelly, two counts of attempted first-degree murder in the cases of Michael and Kate, and one count of aggravated arson. Bail was set on an unprecedented amount of $3 million. Part 5. Hell Hath No Fury In January 1996, a pre-trial show hearing was held. Michael had given a videotaped deposition a month prior to the hearing. The Kansas City Star reported that a month following Michael's surgery, another procedure was required to treat the same bacterial condition and drain an abscess that had formed in his brain. 
This time, there was a very real possibility that he may not survive the surgery to testify against his ex-wife. Thankfully, 40-year-old Michael pulled through the risky procedure and gave evidence in person, telling the court about Deborah's alcohol dependency and that their marriage was loveless and uncaring. With regard to the alleged poisoning, the prosecution presented evidence that Michael's gastrointestinal condition couldn't be attributed to any one diagnosis, but that his symptoms were all indicative of repeated rice and exposure. When it came to the fire, the prosecution asserted that Deborah had splashed a large amount of accelerant throughout the house, so much in fact that when she ignited it, her hair was singed and her bathrobe burned. She ran her head under the shower and discarded her robe on the bathroom floor before running outside in her nightgown. The court heard how the large amount of pour and burn patterns found in the remains of the family home indicated that a large amount of accelerant appeared to have targeted the children's bedroom, closing off any paths of escape. The nature of the damage from the flames to Deborah's bedroom door and the carpet at the base of the door indicated it had been opened during the fire contradicting her account that the door had been closed. Portions of Deborah's videotape police interview were played to the court, supporting the assessment of detectives that her manner at the time had appeared extremely out of the ordinary. The court heard that as investigators picked through the wreckage after the fire, a novel was discovered on Deborah's bed, which she checked out at the local library. The book was about several children burning to death in a house fire that was deliberately lit that wasn't the only recreational reading Deborah had been doing. Her library records also indicated that prior to the fire, she had borrowed several books on intrafamilial homicide. In other words, books about killing members of one's own family. Deborah maintained her innocence. The defense placed the blame for both the fire and Michael's poisoning squarely on Tim, who, of course, was no longer alive to be able to defend such accusations. It was claimed that Tim was motivated to destroy the house out of anger at Michael. This statement wasn't exceptionally far-fetched, given Michael himself had testified that his sometimes physically aggressive relationship with his son was difficult at best. The Manhattan Mercury newspaper later reported that the nanny who worked for the family for four years was approached by Tim one day in 1990. She stated that 8-year-old Tim had confided in her that his parents were arguing so much that they were divorcing. She also stated that Tim was so angry, he burst out that he'd kill his father and burn down the house. The Kansas City Star newspaper reported that the court heard that in 1995, Tim developed somewhat of a fascination with fire and explosives. He liked to sketch bombs and rockets, even concocting Molotov cocktails setting a fire in a neighbor's yard and carrying around fire-related paraphernalia. The nanny also added that on two occasions, she'd found Tim setting fires in trash cans, once in the basement and the other incident in the nanny's kitchen. The explanation for Deborah's unusual demeanor, both at the scene and during her police interview, was that the medication prescribed to manage her mental illness affected her ability to respond as someone normally would when experiencing traumatic events. With the proceedings for the show hearing concluded, Deborah's arraignment was scheduled for early February 1996. Following the show cause hearing, the prosecution announced they would be seeking the death penalty at trial. Before the trial commenced, in what was proving to be one of the most sensational and infamous cases in state history, both the prosecution and the defense made numerous requests to the court about how proceedings would run. In March 1996, Deborah's competence to stand trial was evaluated by the defense psychologist, who later expressed concerns about Deborah's state of mind on the night of the fire, but declared her competent. Deborah's bail remained at $3 million. The defense applied to have the charges heard at separate trials on the basis that it was prejudicial to Deborah, and that the jury would be confused by the evidence and unable to make separate decisions when it came to the murder and poisoning charges. But this request was rejected by the judge, who stated that the evidence in all counts overlapped, citing a compelling factual relationship between the charges. As preparations for the trial commenced, the defense knew that the key to raising sufficient reasonable doubt was discrediting the evidence of fire investigators, who were of the view that the fire was caused by arson, and conducting their own inquiries. 
The defense found that at the time of the fire, Deborah's bathrobe was wrapped in a ball on the floor of her bathroom. Burn marks on the robe were consistent with those commonly found on clothing worn when someone lights a fire. This new revelation halted the attempt by the defense to provide doubts as to Deborah's involvement in both the fire and the alleged poisoning. Faced with an uphill battle in terms of successfully defending their client, Deborah's lawyers enlisted the assistance of her divorce attorney to see if further information could be elicited from their client. Deborah maintained that Tim was the one who had poisoned Michael and admitted to starting the fire, but was unable to provide further details as to how the tragedy unfolded or why. In the end, the case wouldn't proceed to trial. In April 1996, the defense advised the district attorney's office that their client wished to enter a plea bargain. Deborah entered what is known as an Alfred plea. This type of plea is where a defendant maintains their innocence in a crime, but pleads guilty based on the likelihood that the available evidence will prove their guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. For sentencing purposes, it's considered a guilty plea, but is not considered an admission of guilt. At the plea bargain, Michael again attended court, only days after having further brain surgery to treat weakened blood vessels that left him at the risk of suffering a stroke. At the hearing held at Johnson County Circuit Court in Olathe, Deborah pled no contest to two counts of capital murder, one count of aggravated arson, and two counts of attempted first-degree murder. She read a prepared statement, saying, I am aware that the state can produce substantial evidence that I set the fire that caused the death of my children. My attorneys are ready, willing, and able to present evidence that I was not in control of myself when Tim and Kelly died. However true that may be, defending myself at trial on these charges would only compound the suffering of my family and my daughter Kate. I love my family very much. I never meant to harm my children, but I accept the fact that I will be punished harshly. I believe that it is best to end this now so that we can begin to heal from our horrible loss. The plea bargain would ensure that Deborah would avoid the death penalty in the event of a conviction. Following the plea hearing, Deborah's defense reiterated to the media that she accepted full responsibility, but that her intent in setting the fire was not to kill her children. Part 6 Crocodile Tears On May 30th, 1996, Deborah appeared in court for sentencing. The defense psychologist who had originally assessed Deborah as competent to stand trial testified that Deborah was cognitively competent and capable of controlling her emotion at a basic level, but that she had an inability to process emotions at a more complex level. The court heard that the basis of Deborah's psychiatric admissions to hospital were a diagnosis of either major depression or bipolar disorder, that she had an extremely limited capacity to be able to cope emotionally. The defense psychologist was of the view that Deborah had schizoid personality disorder and told the court that Deborah had managed to maintain the veneer of being high-functioning thanks to her level of intellectual intelligence. But under the stain of her chaotic home life, her academic abilities failed to adequately mask her struggle. Deborah received two life prison terms for the murders, two eight-year terms for attempted murder, and four years for aggravated arson, all to run concurrently. This amounted to a total 40-year term with no chance of parole, also known as a hard 40. Following sentencing, Deborah maintained that she had little memory of the events of the night of the fire. Not long after she was incarcerated, she wrote to both Kate and Michael making various claims. These included that she exceeded the recommended dosage of her medications on the night of the fire. The suggestion that Michael's girlfriend Margaret started the fire, and maintaining that Tim was responsible for poisoning Michael. Over the years, other diagnoses have been suggested with regard to Deborah's state of mind, including psychopathy as well as borderline and narcissistic personality disorders. In the year 2000, 49 year old Deborah made an application to the court to withdraw her no contest plea. She claimed that from the time she was arrested, her ability to comprehend the legal proceedings against her was affected due to being under the influence of psychotropic medication. 
However, her request was withdrawn when she was informed that should a retrial be granted, prosecutors would pursue her under the full force of the law by seeking the death penalty. In 2004, Deborah filed another request with the court seeking a retrial in relation to the charges relating to the fire. Her claim was based on the argument that advances made in the field of fire science related to arson investigations since her conviction would prove her innocence. However, the court determined that Deborah had failed to present any new evidence to support her claim that a charge of arson had been disproved and her request for a trial was denied. In December 2014, the Kansas City Star newspaper reported that 63-year-old Deborah was seeking a new sentencing hearing. Deborah claimed her sentence was unconstitutional, citing a decision by the Kansas Supreme Court the previous year, which ruled that sentences such as Deborah's should be determined by a jury and not a judge. The following month, the Johnson County District Court determined that the ruling could not be applied to Deborah's sentence retrospectively and that her case did not represent one of manifest injustice. Deborah continues to serve her sentence at the Topeka Correctional Facility in Kansas, where she is currently classified as a low to medium security prisoner. Her earliest possible release date is November 2035. Only three months after Deborah was sentenced, Michael faced two more heart surgeries. Following the conviction, Michael and Kay faced a new struggle in rebuilding not only their shattered lives, but their broken relationship. One of the many long term consequences of Deborah's behavior in turning her children against their father. Michael continues to practice medicine and remarried in 1997, but not to Margaret, the couple having parted ways in 1996. At the cemetery where Tim and Kelly's ashes are interred, a poem by Mary Elizabeth Fry can be found poignantly marking the children's final resting place. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not here. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond's guilt on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn's rain. When you awake in the morning's hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds in circled flight. I am the soft stars that shine in the night. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not here. I did not die. Listener, have you tried Native deodorant? Native creates safe, simple, effective products that people use in the bathroom every day. Products with trusted ingredients and trusted performance. Not convinced? Check out the 9,000 five-star reviews from their customers. Native deodorant is formulated without aluminum, parabens, and talc. Instead, it's filled with ingredients found in nature, such as coconut oil, shea butter, and tapioca starch. Native comes in a wide variety of enticing scents for men and women. Plus, they release new, limited-edition seasonal scents throughout the year. They also offer an unscented formula and baking soda-free formula for those with sensitivities. My wife tried the lavender and rose scent, and she loved it. I personally thought it smelled great. The best part is, Native is a no-risk try. They offer free returns and exchanges in the USA. For 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and use promo code OBSCURA during checkout. Again, for 20% off, visit nativedeodorant.com and use promo code OBSCURA during checkout. Listener, have you heard of Warby Parker? Warby Parker is a new concept in eyewear. The good people at Warby Parker believe that eyewear shouldn't cost you more than a new iPhone. 
Almost 1 million people worldwide lack access to glasses. This means that 15% of the global population cannot effectively learn or work. Warby Parker partners with nonprofits like Vision Spring to ensure that for every pair of glasses sold, a pair is distributed to someone in need. Warby Parker glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. Lenses include anti glare and anti scratch coatings. These glasses look great. Don't believe me? Warby Parker offers a free home try on program. Order five pairs of glasses and try them on for five days. There is no obligation to buy. Ships free and includes a prepaid return shipping label. And if you need help, take the quiz. I took it myself and it was easy. Answer a few quick questions and they'll suggest some slick looking glasses. Each personalized to fit your face and style. Not interested in glasses? Consider Scout by Warby Parker. Comfortable and breathable daily contact lenses for less than $1.25 a day. Order the free home try-on program or request a trial of Scout contact lenses for just $5. Visit warbyparker.com slash obscura to learn more. Again, warbyparker.com slash obscura.